Um, my name is Jonina um, Abron Irvin. Um, I was in the Black Panther Party in Detroit, Michigan. That's where I joined. Uh, Detroit is the, the motor capital uh, of the United States where all the cars are produced. Um, I, you know, I, in the Black Panther Party in Detroit, I worked in a lot of our survival programs, the breakfast program for children, where we serve kids free hot breakfast. I also helped to sell the Black Panther newspaper. We would go downtown, downtown Detroit, and sell the newspaper. And I also uh, drove in our busing to prisons program, the Black Panther Party. One of our survival programs was to give the families of people in prisons once a month uh, a ride to the prisons where their family members were being incarcerated because a lot of people were poor, did not have cars, did not have a way to get there. So uh, we called it the busing pro busing program. We didn't actually have a bus in Detroit. We had a car, but I would drive uh, in that. Um, so that was my work, primarily my work in Detroit where I joined the Black Panther Party. Then when we relocated to the national headquarters in Oakland, California, my primary work was to work on the newspaper, the Black Panther newspaper, which at one point um, had the, it was sort of fluctuated between being the first and the second most highly circulated black newspaper in the United States wow. in the late 60s and early 70s. And I also worked at our school. The Black Panther Party started an elementary level school for kids ages two and a half to 11. And I taught uh, grammar, English, spelling, writing, and reading. So that was some of my, my main activities in the Black Panther Party. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Well, as for me, I uh, started in the uh, Civil Rights Movement, actually. Uh, since the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, sort of was the forerunner for the Black Panther Party and for Black Power itself, uh, in 1965, uh, the organization went over from um, you know, nonviolence and from the earlier uh, civil rights perspective over to black uh, power and um, you know, ex actually expelled all the whites out of the organization and uh, became more of a uh, militant organization that practiced armed self-defense. And um, so my history started in, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, my hometown where I'm from, and uh, you know, sort of flowed into uh, activism in the civil rights period, then into the Black Panther Party, when the Black Panther Party and the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee merged, merged in 1967 uh, through 69. And um, the leaders of the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, H. Rap Brown, uh, as he was known then, Stokely Carmichael, and uh, George, uh, James Foreman, James Foreman, uh, were actually uh, drafted by Huey P. Newton and some of the other leaders of the, of the newly emerged Black Panther Party into uh, becoming, you know, a, 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 I guess a coalition or whatever you want to call it. It's debatable what, what they call it, but at any rate, the organizations had uh, joint leadership. And... Um, it was in that period that, that myself and others uh, made the move to go into the Black Panther Party. Now, for me, at an earlier stage, and uh, and also having been an activist in the South and another organization, uh, we uh, were still continuing to do uh, anti-Klan organizing. In fact, uh, mm. the Lowndes County Freedom Organization was the first organization that used the uh, leaping Black Panther Party. That was its uh, symbol. And, um, and practice armed self-defense against the Ku Klux Klan and against other white supremacist uh, officials and so forth, the white racist government. And um, so the SNCC had already built a base. It had a long history as, a, as an organization, and it had trained organizers, and this is why the Black Panther Party wanted it and wanted them to work with it at an earlier stage. This is the Nonviolent Coordinating Committee? Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what it was known when it was first created. Yeah. It later changed its name to the Student National Coordinating Committee, but it, okay, yeah. in essence, it's the same organization. Yeah, and uh, this is the organization that produced Black Power. This is where the ideology mm. for Black Power came from, mm. from that organization and from uh, Stokely Carmichael and uh, Willie uh, Ricks, who were uh, 
well, Ricks was, was actually my uh, mentor. I actually came from my hometown. And um, these, uh, this period, uh, 65 through 69 was the period of black militancy inside SNCC itself. And then later, uh, they, you know, as I said, merged with the uh, student nonviolent, uh, merged with the Black Panther Party, which was formed in 1966. Hmm. Well, you know, it would have been great if we'd had the internet, you know, 40, 45 years ago, um, because the Black Panther newspaper, um, you know, we could have, we, we would have still probably have distributed the paper copies, but we could have had, you know, a website and people could have gone and, you know, seen it. So I think there have been a lot of advances, you know, uh, and also it would have been a great, would have been great because the different chapters and branches of the Black Panther Party could have kept in contact with mm -hmm. each other. Then we had to just rely on a telephone or telegram, so it was a lot, you know, a lot slower. Um, I think that the way, with, with the advance of the internet, it really helps people to do their organizational work. You can spread the word about if you're having an event, or you, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the revolutions, the, the, the Arab summer, the revolutions that happened mm -hmm. in other countries, they were able to use Facebook and Twitter to really organize some of those. So they are very, very powerful tools, and we use a, a lot of that in our own work. Um, however, ultimately, the, the people who are organizers, community organizers, still have to talk to people face to face. Mm -hmm. You cannot rely solely on the internet. Mm -hmm. So you have to know what to use it for and how to use it. But you know, there are still some people, at least in the United States, maybe poor low income people who don't have access to the internet 24 hours a day. They may only have access when they go to a public library. Yeah. And you know, and once they leave the library, they don't have access. So you still have to go and talk to people. But I think that the internet is definitely uh, a major uh, advance and really helps activists do their work a lot easier. Well, the FBI had had a program called the uh, the Counterintelligence Program that had been created originally in 1957 against the Communist Party. Mm. Uh, the so-called Black Desk or uh, or the racial uh, component of it was created to neutralize the um, uh, Black Panther Party, primarily the Black Panther Party, but even before the Black Panther Party, the the Black uh, Power Movement generally, mm. uh, and um, Part of doing this was to try to keep, uh, you know, activists like the Black Panther Party away from youth. Uh, one of the strengths they recognized uh, with the Black Panther Party was this ability to reach youth uh, and to mobilize youth to join it. And the majority of those in the Black Panther Party were far and away under the age of 25, in fact. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the government's prime uh, objective was to keep that away from it. But also the newspaper, the Black Panther newspaper, was extremely important, even now to this, in this period, in the sense that it was able to take uh, uh, theoretical and political uh, issues of great uh, complexity and, and break it down so that people could understand it and so that people, in fact, could, could re, uh, restate it in terms when they were out to the feel as organizers to be able to talk to ordinary people. So the Black Panther newspaper was extremely important in that sense. It was also important in terms of the the imagery that was used by uh, uh, Eric Eric uh, was it, uh, Douglas Emory uh, Douglas. Emory Douglas. I'm sorry, it's early okay. in the morning. Emory Douglas, who uh, was probably still is the in my mind the most effective and the best uh, political journalist ever seen in the United States. Cartoonist, yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, he's the best ever seen. And um, the, the, the beauty of his uh, technique of, of imagery was to take the downtrodden masses, put them in a form where the people could look at them and identify them almost as though it were a photograph mm. and, and have under there a very simple text about what people were suffering mm. or about what the program 
this particular program of the Black Panther Party was designed to address. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was powerful, the, the images of people standing up in resistance to white racism and, and the police. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, and all these, and all these ideals of, 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 of basically real potent but complex ideas, mm -hmm. boil them down so people can understand them and even put them in imagery form. And so in that sense, the Black Panther newspaper was unparalleled uh, before or since in my mind. Yeah. Uh, now, as far as the repression, though, the repression came down around about uh, 69, late 68, 69. Uh, you know, you had people start being arrested on uh, frame-up cases mm. uh, as well as people who were arrested for uh, just basic political activism, mm. you know, harassed and so forth. And, uh, and of course, there were uh, also acts of violence by the police. In my case, though, you know, I uh, was in, in, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where I'm from, and we were, we were in the first phases of building the uh, a, a Black Panther Party there and uh, was um, framed on one charge, uh, uh, which went to trial of kidnapping a uh, informer and uh, stealing a car. We were framed on that, and we beat those charges. But then uh, around that time, Dr. Martin Luther King was murdered in Tennessee. Hmm. And that was in 1968, April 1968. Hmm. And uh, around this time, after the, the shooting, uh, you know, he was murdered. Hmm. Then there was a huge uh, um, rebellion all over the country, black hmm. rebellion all over the country hmm. uh, against police, uh, against this, this shooting, which they suspected the police and government having a role in. Hmm. And uh, so the people re rebelled. And in, in my hometown, there was a huge rebellion. Uh, the office of uh, one of the Ku Klux Klansmen was blown up, who also happened to be a judge. And um, uh, later, I was charged with this, or at least was questioned about it at a, before a grand jury. And I was locked up and was, and, and was you know, being held uh, for several months to make me testify before a grand jury and all this kind of thing. But they wanted to get were informers. Meanwhile, at the same time, some of the leaders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, were being uh, prosecuted in absentia in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, for uh, treason and this sort of thing. So treason. Treason, yes, treason to the state. Wow. And there were these uh, these uh, grand juries all over the state of Tennessee, you know, looking into local black militants, investigating local black militants. So I was eventually uh, run out of town, essentially. I was told that if I didn't cooperate, a cop told me this, that, that I'd gone to school, said they've got you set up. If you don't get out of here, uh, they're going to they're gonna wind up killing you. Wow. That's, that's what's going to happen. You wind up, you're going to wind up dying in jail, and that's going to be the end of it. So I got out of town, went to Atlanta, which is like 100 miles away, larger city, and it's also where uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee had its old base, you know, its mm -hmm. offices. And so, so I was just like laying low. And then um, one day it popped up on... Uh, uh, the newspaper that I in, in in television that I was being sought by the FBI for for the bombing and the inciting the riot and all this and I said well you know, you know and everything it startled me you know but I realized that I had to get out of the country I, there was no real underground for black militants in those mm -hmm. days there really wasn't you know you couldn't hide uh, you know people would run you down plus these organizations were so infiltrated mm -hmm. with informants and agents and so forth you you know they they, they they could catch up with you pretty easily. And so in my case, I, I had to get out of the country, and the only way I, could, I couldn't go and apply for a passport, obviously. So I, uh, we, we, there, were, there had been high plane hijackings by uh, 1969, and uh, so I went to the Atlanta airport and got a flight to Cuba and just took it over. And landed in. How did you do that? I mean, you, oh. you, you, you hijacked a plane. Yeah, well, I, I had a, a firearm uh, <laughs> and a, a grenade. A wow. military grenade, and uh, you know, and went in, and uh, was the plane going to Cuba originally? It was going no, no, no. It was going to Florida, <laughs> and and um, right. the, there was a uh, and back in those days, because there had been so many plane hijackers, there was a, um, a sky marshal they called him. Yeah, yeah. and um, so I uh, knew who knew who he was. You could just point him out. You yeah, could I could, yeah, cop. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They had cop written all over him. You know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Had, had a sign said cop. All right, and okay. I just went over and, 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 and you know put a gun in his neck, <laughs> took him took him to the front to where the, to where the pilot was, and uh, had the, had them open the door, and I went in, you know, 
right. and diverted the plane. And told them, that, you know, yeah, we're going to Cuba. Yeah, we're going to Cuba. So <laughs> they, they, it wasn't that far away. It was only ninety miles. Yeah, of course, yeah, it's quite close. To so we flew over and we 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 uh, landed in Cuba, and um, of course, this made me a really wanted man, you know, as far as the FBI was concerned, you know, and um, they they put out a worldwide what they call a worldwide lookout for me, you know, right, right. and uh, and everything, and I. I stayed in Cuba for a while. There were some political problems with the Cuban government and, and Eldridge Cleaver at that time. He was in Cuba mm-hmm. and he was having a, a row with these people, you know, in the Cuban government. Uh, various little incidents had taken place. And so they couldn't do anything to him, but they took it out on the rest of us. Uh, you know, anybody they considered Black Panther, they locked us up, Some of, many of us. In Cuba? Anyway. You were in Cuba, to. yeah, we were locked up. And I was locked up uh, for several months and then uh, deported. And they deported several other uh, persons they considered Black Panthers mm-hmm. out of there. Or if you're affiliated with, at least, uh, with you know, Elders Cleaver. They thought you were affiliated with Elders Cleaver's wing. You were out of there. Right. You know, this is adventurism and so forth and so on. So they shipped me to uh, uh, Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. Prague. Well, I don't have a magic answer to that. Um, I know it, um, ultimately, I guess people, it depends on who the infiltrator is. If, if it's a, a cop who's been trained to come in, it may be very difficult mm. to figure out who they are. I think ultimately a, a lot of groups, you, you have to go ahead and do what you're doing and knowing that there may be undercover cops informants in the organization. Because uh, you can't really accuse someone of being mm. an undercover cop unless you have direct proof. Now, if you gather enough proof and stuff, then you can make the accusation. Mm. But you have to assume that there will be some in the group. Mm. And, of course, they want you, they want your fear of that to maybe k- keep you from organizing. So uh, you, just, you have to go ahead and do what you have to do. In the Black Panther Party, uh, after a certain period of time, uh, we stopped accepting new members. Because people could, at the beginning could just walk in and say, I want to join, and they join. But we didn't know what the counterintelligence program was exactly. But at some point, we knew we were being infiltrated. So they you know, put a stop on new members and new, and new chapters and branches because we didn't know how to deal with it. You know, we, we knew. But um, I think sometimes the undercover informants um, may reveal themselves if you pay attention, if you see, if you hear people or see people doing things that you know is not on the path that your organization has sought, uh, start to pay attention to them. You know, obviously you can't accuse them of anything, but listen to them. If you see that they're doing disruptive things to get you off your mission, things that may bring you into conflict that will obviously will bring you into conflict Arrest. with the cops. Mm-hmm. So well, why you know why you know ask them why are you proposing this mm. you know this this will make things harder for us so mm-hmm. you have to do that but on the other hand you can't get paralyzed with fear because mm-hmm. uh, they're going to do it and as you as your newspaper the Guardian has shown uh, with the uh, revelations about the cooperation be- between the NSA and G- GC HQ HQ mm-hmm. yeah. it's going on yeah you know and, and it probably will continue to go on. just a quick question on this like. I mean, so the, the Black Panther Party actually stopped accepting new members. Was that permanent? Was that contributing? It wasn't to permanent, no. no. But it actually did for a while. I, you know, I can use myself as an example. Uh, I joined the Black Panther Party in Detroit, Michigan. There were ab- actually two chapters of the Black Panther Party in Detroit. The first chapter started probably around 68 or something like that. Mm, mm. And at some point, the people who started that chapter became aware that they were being infiltrated by undercover informants. The central headquarters in Oakland, California was aware of it. So what they did was they disbanded that chapter. They said, we don't know who all's in there. We know everybody's not a police informant, but we know there's some informants in there. That's been documented mm-hmm. in the uh, 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 the COINTELPRO documents that became public. It talks about the placement of a police informant in the Detroit chapter of the Black Panther Party. So the central office of the Black Panther Party just said, we're sorry, we have to shut this chapter down. We don't know what's going on. And then a year or so later, they reopened it up. So I joined, joined the reopened chapter in Detroit, Michigan, after they had figured out who was what and what was going on. 
but it wasn't a permanent uh, not accepting, but definitely for a while, we didn't have any choice. We didn't know what we were up mm. against. We didn't know what was happening. Mm. Well, you know, first of all, you know, this was a different historical period. Mm. Uh, I was in prison from 1969 to 19, actually 1984. And um, the, the situation for us then was uh, they didn't have, uh, they hadn't created what they call now the, the uh, special handling or special housing units. Right. And uh, they, they created those later, and, and they created those because of the success of the black prisoners movement of the 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, we were extremely powerful. We were essentially running the prisons, and uh, we were a political revolutionary force that had uh, actually become the central uh, radical institution in America, mm -hmm. uh, the prisoners movement, the black prisoners movement. Mm -hmm. And, and so... Um, when they uh, went over to using uh, the special housing units, which was for long-term uh, solitary confinement, when they, when they actually went over to using this, it was as a uh, tool to try to destroy the, the movement as a whole. And so I was locked up uh, for quite some time. Uh, I, I managed, however, to file uh, the first time uh, when I was in Springfield, uh, Missouri, they created what they call the Special Training and Rehabilitative Special Treatment and Rehabilitative Training Unit, which was uh, for behavior modification, brainwashing, more or less. And they, it was experimental, and they used doctors in there to try to force you to take drugs and all this kind of thing, you know, psychotropic drugs. Well, um, we were able, I was able to get out of that unit myself, and when I got out uh, by, order, by order of a court, I was able to uh, contact people in the street in fact, there was a book written by Jessica Mitford called Kind and Usual Punishment, which was written at this time that exposed it. And, uh, and also there were exposures in the newspaper and, and there was lawsuits filed and everything. And eventually the place was ruled to be uh, unconstitutional and so forth, and they closed it down. But uh, I, people spent a lot of time in there. Some people spent uh, years and years. And when they came out, some people committed suicide. You know, oh, they, yeah. the, the psychological conditioning had, had warped their brains, you know, and they just they, they committed suicide. Uh, so we, we're talking about um, this being used as a tool. They refined it over the course yeah. of years. Yeah. They refined it. And, and now it's long-term confinement plus behavior modification you know, plus starvation and whatever else is a tool for them to work to just try to destroy your will. On that last point of like um, how they've refined it and, and really try to lock down um, black, particularly black mm -hmm. struggle within these prisons. Um, I, um, I know we've heard about the Californian hunger, prison hunger strike right. at the moment. And what are your thoughts about how that's, you know, how that's developed and do you see right. uh, a resurgence of like, Radical Well, well that's like a good that. question, whether we're seeing the resurgence of radicalism. I don't know that part, but I do know this. Uh, the protest was against solitary confinement. Mm, 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 and, 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 to, and that tells me a great deal, yeah. you know, having been in prison. That tells me that uh, the prisons have reached this level of consciousness, that they recognize uh, what the officials are doing and that they have to fight it head on. And that every struggle from now on out is going to have to deal with that. And mm. I think that that's what you're going to see. You're going to see this one strike become many strikes ultimately, and become many uh, acts of resistance, not just strikes. Who knows what's going to happen mm. from here on out? But I think you're going to see more and more of that because the officials have have made the determination what they're going to do is that when you just come to prison from now on, and this is what they're doing, if they're just throwing you into uh, what used to be called solitary confinement, uh, and now it's just behavior modification units throw you in there and just leave you in there for, for all of your time. You got 50 years, you'll be in there 50 years. Mm -hmm. and, and so these two things, actually, the death of Herman Wallace, who spent 43 years in solitary confinement mm -hmm. uh, and as an ex-Black Panther, mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, California prison strike, both in the same year, yeah. uh, tells us a great deal. You know, from my perspective, the, what I picked up from it is that um, the prisoners themselves are on a wavelength to, to destroy it. We had a strike. Uh, when I was in Marion, Illinois, that's where they created the 
uh, Behavior Modification Program, the H unit, uh, they called it, which was, at that time was the highest level security institution in the world. Right. And um, we had a strike in 1978, from 78, I think, to 80. Wow. And um, we were um, subjected to all kind of persecution, uh, the so-called leaders of it. You know, I was one of the first wave of so-called leaders that they grabbed up and, and uh, for the strike to try to break it. Mm. And uh, they threw me first in uh, what they call the isolation unit. And the isolation unit was just basic, you know, solitary confinement. Mm. And uh, we rebelled. We, we, <laughs> they couldn't control us. We rebelled and, and we, we broke out of the cells and all this stuff. And, and uh, I was, you know, grabbed up and beaten up and all this kind of stuff. And friends of ours, and they drug us then off to uh, the Asia block, as they call it, which mm. was the... Uh, the behavior, the behavior modification unit, you know, they took us there to uh, confine us under tighter conditions. And while we were in there, we found a way to break out of the cells in there and and, and it kept fighting. But uh, some of our comrades got really badly hurt. One mm. of them got his arm broke, smashed on the oh, doors of, of the cell when he was trying to escape. Now, the thing about these places there in, in, um, in Marion is that they had a, it wasn't just a cell they put you in. It was a cell plus... Uh, cage plus uh, plus a um, ballistic glass, you know. So you're like buried alive, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and, and they even had a worse unit called the box cars, where they didn't even give you day or night. Wow. Could tell whether it was day or night. And uh, it was just dark all the time, you Amazing. know. And uh, so um, all of this was designed to break you. And then they had through the uh, the vents, and uh, they had a little sound system hooked up in the lights. It's torture, basically. It's torture, yeah. So that they can brainwash you, give you messages at night, and all this kind of garbage. Uh, then they had the uh, lights on all the time. The, you know, the stuff you're talking about sounds like yeah. what Guantanamo Bay yeah, uh, it's, people. It, it, is it was exactly. tested out on on, on you guys yeah. first. It they, is. they 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 tested out the techniques on so-called civil prisoners, prisoners who were not tried by military tribunals. Mm. They tried it. You know, in, in criminal courts, they try they, they use it on us first, yes, yes. and now um, they're using it, um, of course, in Guantanamo, and they use it in other parts of the of world course, as well. Of course, you know, you know, we don't know about. to torture prisoners. So, um, but but even with all of that, even with all of that, you know, and even with all the solitary confinement, even with all the repression and all the torture, they still apparently don't have a handle on the movement. They still have not been have not found a way Amazing. to comp completely control the prison population so that they wouldn't uh, resist in some form or fashion, and that, and that tells me a great deal. Mm. Uh, that tells me uh, that tells me everything. The fact that these prisons are able to coordinate. Uh, of course, if you look at what's happening in California, you have to look back a couple of years to what happened in Georgia, mm. because in Georgia, all the prisons came together. All you know, dispersed institutions in different parts of the state of Georgia and everything, and they had a, a hunger strike. And it lasted for several uh, weeks. Wow. And and, uh, and it, so it like laid the foundation for what happened in California. Mm. Now, I don't remember the precise demands uh, of the hunger strike. I do remember one of the demands. Now, one of them had to do with the uh, Georgia Special Housing Unit, which is the behavior, co the behavior modification stuff, right. uh, unit and so forth, and long-term confinement. So this is a serious issue. Mm. Uh, it probably is going to be one of the most decisive issues of the prison struggle in this period. In, in the previous period, it was other things, mm. and, and that movement saw itself as part of the Black Power movement. And uh, this movement, uh, is, you know, since there isn't the, uh, the uh, kind of movement in the streets as it was then, this movement sees itself as fighting for uh, uh, to destroy the, the this regime of of uh, behavior modification, uh, psychological conditioning and long-term confinement in solitary confinement. And I did nine years in solitary confinement, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is nothing in comparison to what they do now. I mean, that, you know? that, that's amazing. Well, for me personally, um, I actually did not expect Obama to be uh, elected. I didn't mm. even expect him to win the Democratic nomination. I mm. thought Hillary Clinton you know, had it hands down, and I felt that way because he's a black man, and I felt like institutionalized racism in the United States was still so strong that there was no way that he was going to become the nominee of the Democratic Party. And then when he won the nomination, I said, okay, he got the nomination, but America is not going to elect a black president. And uh, of course, Lorenzo was arguing with me all along, oh, he's going to be elected because the, the politicians, the bankers need him. 
uh, need him to be president of the United States to help kind of restore the country's image after eight years of George Bush. So I was a big skeptic that he was even going to be elected. I'll be honest about it. I had mm. no, you know, didn't think he was going to be elected. Um, so, but he was, so obviously I was wrong. The election of Obama, um, it has, Obama's election was meant to uh, derail, co-op, pacify any kind of radical political movements or ideas in the United States. Uh, his election has been a severe blow to radical uh, political action in the United States, whether it's, I don't care whether it's black, <coughs> Asian, white, whatever it is, it's, it has been destructive to any radical, uh, it's been one of the most serious blows. I mean, the destruction of the black power movement uh, certainly was a serious blow then, but his election was been, been a very serious blow because he's black. You know, we were meant to feel like, oh, we've got a black president mm -hmm. now. Everything's going so. to be all right. There were even some people running around saying, well, Obama's election means that America is now a post-racial society which is absolutely absurd. The average black person knows that. They know there's still racism, and other people know it too. But at any rate, um, we feel that his, uh, his election has been uh, very uh, destructive uh, to any kind of radical political action. It's been meant to, as I said, to co-opt uh, that, that action. If you, uh, in your country, uh, for instance, you have a, we, we have a serious problem so far as black people in America are concerned. We have the highest level of black unemployment in the United States since the Great Depression. Wow. Now, Obama is not Obama's fault that happened. The conditions that caused that were in place before he became president. But he has not enacted any policies whatsoever to deal with it mm. or you know, even spoken about it. Mm. Uh, even if he may not have total control, he, there is a Congress and he has to mm. negotiate things with Congress. But he has said nothing about that. We have mass black imprisonment in the United States. America has 5% of the world's population, but, but the country has 25% of the incarcerated people in the world are in the United States, but we just have 5% of the population. Mm -hmm. And the majority of those people are black people, uh, or, or, or Hispanic uh, people, Puerto Rican people. Obama has said nothing, he has enacted no policies to, to deal with that. In fact, many people who are in prison are there because of the so-called drug war mm. in the United States, and they've gotten these really long, excessively long sentences. His attorney general, the attorney general of the United States, the top legal lawyer, who is also African American, has said he's going to try to do something to modify these sentences, but haven't seen any action. Mm. So, you know, Obama has, under the Obama administration, the United States has had the highest level of deportation of immigrants than any other president. I know the issue of immigration is very, uh, and deportation of immigrants is a very serious issue here in the mm. UK, but the United States certainly, certainly cannot criticize the UK. And the people who are the leftists, radicals, they don't want to talk about the fact that, you know, Obama, that, that this is the highest level of deportation of immigrants. They don't want to talk about the fact that imprisonment, mass imprisonment of black people is at its highest levels. They don't want to talk about the high level uh, of, of black unemployment. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, um, we view his election uh, as negative. That's what, that's what we think. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting you say that. Obama's actually been a destructive force, not just a pacifying one. Mm -hmm. um, and with, uh, you know, a lot of people had aspirations that there's a black president, as you said, there's going to be a great change. And that was even his slogan, right? That, you know, mm -hmm. a change's come and he's um, used the uh, the legacy of Martin Luther King to sort of position himself as a sort of uh, a black leader, not just a, the president of the United States, but also a black leader in the sense that he's saying he's continuing the legacy of the civil rights movement. But we've seen recently that the Voting Rights um, Act of 1968 has been struck down by um, the, by the um, Supreme Court. Um, we've also seen Trayvon Martin with the Stand Your Ground law in, in Florida and it being used like perversely in Trayvon Martin's case. But then also again with Maurice, Marissa Alexander who at the moment is um, fighting a, an appeal. So what I wanted to know is in terms of like the civil rights legacy and your, invo your active involvement in it as Black Panthers and fighting mm. Um, for human rights of, of black people, whether it's in prison, whether it's on the street, 
um, what do you how do you see um, like the civil rights legacy in relation to Obama? And I'd like to get both of your views on that. <clears throat> I really believe that um, uh, Obama. Um, someone told us we, we wrote an article uh, called um, uh, "Black Faces in High Places," and um, in that article we quoted an individual who said that. Uh, Barack Obama was the 21st century face of fascism, uh, the friendly fascism, mm -hmm. if you will. Well, and, um, yeah. you know, so his, his role is to, as Janana was saying, to neutralize protests, uh, but to extend empire. And uh, so he has done nothing for the black community. He, never, he didn't even come into office uh, with any realistic program of doing anything for the black community in terms of the, the, the kind of targeted forms of oppression that we have historically faced. And, um, you know, basically um, he has opened the door for a number of opportunist politicians from the left mm. to serve with him more or less. You know, you've got uh, one guy down in, in Mississippi that uh, been, he's been elected the mayor of the, of the city of Jackson, Mississippi, and he had been in previous years calling for uh, a nation state of five southern states and all this sort of thing. Uh, now he's working with Obama. You've got um, one guy who was supposed to have been a communist, uh, uh, you know, a youth organizer or something mm -hmm. or other. Now he, he was in Obama's administration. So you've got a kind of opportunism mm -hmm. that's, that's taking place right along with Obama and his activities. And his activities, as, as has been pointed out, have been harmful to the black community. Uh, especially in terms of law enforcement, in terms of these number of, of black people who are being shot and killed every year. Everybody admits that uh, there's upwards of a thousand people killed every year by the American police forces. And this has been going on for quite some time now. He could do something about this if, if he so chose to do, you know, because he's got a, uh, he's over the, uh, the so-called uh, FBI and, mm -hmm. the, and the Department of Justice. Uh, he could do something if he wished to about the massive number of black people in the prison system, mm -hmm. you know, where uh, blacks and uh, 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 Puerto Ricans and, and also other Latinos make up something like uh, 75 to 80 percent of those in the prison system. Wow. And so we're talking about almost two million people. And um, he could do something about this and he could do something about poverty. Uh, and unemployment, which is uh, at record levels in the black community. In fact, depression levels, mm. in, in the Great Depression levels in the black community. He could do something about all of these things. But his role is to work for the bankers and the central bank especially and uh, to see to it that uh, Wall Street is furnished, whatever Wall Street wishes, in terms of uh, capital and in terms of, of weak legislation or whatever. That's his role. And uh, his role as a, as a warmonger, you know, uh, you know, bombing essentially most of the, most of the people of the world, many many countries, uh, having declared war. We talked about this even before he took office. We tried. We wrote an article about this, as I said, and we tried to put this out to uh, activists and radicals, and um, and had been pretty much you know isolated as a result of that, you know. Uh, if not attacked, some people right. attacked us and so forth, and some people still do. I mean, some mm. people waked up, waking up, waked up and saw it, and woken up and saw it, I should say, and then others still continue to ride his boat down the river. You know, mm, mm, <laughs> mm. Uh, so our thing is that Obama is part of the enemy class. Yeah, we're going to have to fight o Obama's administration just like we fought Bush and all the rest of yeah. them. You know, he's a representative of capital. He is not a representative of, of labor and of the people. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's really important for us in this period to diffuse some of this stuff. So we do organizing, education, and all this, and we co have come out and told people we are opposed to electoral politics, period, yeah. because electoral yeah. politics is one of the things that maintains empire and, and, and also uh, misleads the masses of people, mm -hmm. puts them to sleep. And uh, so we're, we've got a tough job in that sense, but this is where we're going. Well, in the sense of Malcolm X uh, as a spokesperson for the Nation of Islam, uh, the Nation of Islam assumed relevance in the 1960s even. Uh, but um, before Malcolm X, uh, the Nation of Islam was not a mass movement. It was not a national program. Uh, 
you know, for a considerable period of the 1960s, the Nation of Islam was anathema to many black militants. And, uh, and this was because of the assassination of, of Malcolm X and the, the denigration of Malcolm X and, and, the, and, and as many saw it, the mistreatment of Malcolm X. Uh, it assumed a certain amount of, of popularity and, and, and um, uh, relevance during the uh, early 1970s and late 1980s with, with the rise of Louis Farrakhan. And um, we're not sympathetic to the nation. Uh, we have ideological, we've all, the, any, the Black Panther Party always had ideological differences with the Nation of Islam. And of course, uh, one of the things that the Nation of Islam did that was kind of interesting and distressing for us is that it created a so-called New Black Panther Party, which was a, which we consider to be really a, uh, a lampooning almost of, of the original Black Panther Party in terms of its politics and its you know misbehavior in terms of just you know this vile kind of a backward nationalism and so forth mm -hmm. that it pushes forward. But it also uh, comes at a time when the national security state, the, the American government, is in conflict over conquest of empire in uh, the Middle East and. Uh, and it's, and it's been forced and is, is further being forced to persecute uh, Muslims in the United States as well as uh, oversee that similar kinds of uh, persecution in the UK and other countries that have considerable size uh, Muslim populations in the West. Now, w what the Nation of Islam has to do with all this, I do not know. I mean, it is not recognized by many countries uh, as even an authentic version of Islam. You know, it's seen to be some sort of American cult, and pretty much that's what we think it is as well. Um, it has a considerable number of black people. We recognize that fact, and, and sometimes we find ourselves on the same side of the uh, political bar in, in opposite, sure. you know, in, in, in opposing, let's say, for instance, police brutality or, or something like that. But it, we don't recognize it. We don't work with it, uh, to be quite honest, and, um, and never really have. We were an independent, autonomous movement many times in opposition to the nation since they took the posture that no one else had the right to organize in the black community mm -hmm. but themselves in the 1960s. But despite all that, and we don't make that the, the biggest issue, you know, in, the, in this period, certainly, uh, it has enjoyed a certain level of, of it's enjoyed a certain level of um, uh, public support because there it has not been a Black Panther Party. It is, and it's enjoyed it because there has not been a mass anti-racist movement in this period. Mm -hmm. Uh, but beyond that, I don't, I don't, I don't see the relevance of it really. I mean, it's just, a, it's just a religious cult, and it does have a, a popular leadership and so forth because they get access to mass media. Uh, but no, uh, we think that the next movement to come is going to come from the streets, from the youth, and uh, we're trying to make that happen. We're trying to uh, politically uh, organize the youth and uh, try to politically uh, deal with the youth. And that's one reason why we're having a conference in the United States, uh, in our hometown, in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, the first of next year, you know, January 18th and 19th of next year, to try to create and train a new generation of organizers so that they don't have to fall prey for, for religious demagoguery, mm -hmm. or they don't have to fall prey for some kind of political uh, scam or something uh, running behind some politician and so forth, which is another thing that happens a lot with the youth. Mm -hmm. The youth need to develop a radical political program of their own to deal with their own conditions in this period, you know what I'm saying? And we'll help to the degree we can. But ultimately, the youth have got to be able to, to, to be the backbone of that movement. And that's extremely important in, in this period to be able to do that. Do you have any final words, Jelena? Um, we, we really are seeking to build um, an international solidarity movement to fight racism and police brutality. And we would like to invite people in the UK who wish to work with us on that. Um, we, we have a coalition, the IDA. B. Wells Coalition Against Racism and Police Brutality. Ida B. Wells was a black journalist, a feminist. Um, um, she was born after the Civil War in the US, late 19th century. She came here, she was invited to the UK in 1893 by anti-racist activists here, socialists and others, to speak about her documented research on the number of black people that were murdered and lynched by the Ku Klux Klan after the Civil War. She had it thoroughly researched, and so she was invited here to the UK to speak. 
uh, and because people here were interested in it, and to get international support then. So we want to continue international solidarity <coughs> against uh, racism and police brutality and the Klan and these neo-fascist groups. And uh, people can contact us through our email, organize, O-R-G-A-N-I-Z-E dot T-H-E dot hood, H-O-O-D, at gmail.com. And you may also find information about it on our Facebook page. We have an organization called the Black Autonomy Federation. If you go on Facebook, just type in Black Autonomy Federation. Thank you so much. Okay.